Testing, 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 one, two, testing.
didst meet thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. To my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang. Proclaiming thy royal decree, but of lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in great humility, oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. In my heart for thee. When the heaven shall ring and the
Well, good morning. 832. 840. No, it's 832. <laughs> Welcome to worship. Thank you for your faithfulness and coming to worship as a body together here at Canyons Church. We want to welcome you. If you're visiting, we want to welcome you. Um, we have a gift for you on the way out. Um, so please make sure we can get your information so we can follow up with you and, and receive your gift as well. Uh, we're so excited that this is Christmas week, and uh, there's really, it really is the best time of the year, Christmas is, at least to me it is, and I love celebrating the birth of our Savior. Um, we also have something else to be excited about. Our goal for Lottie Moon this year, the church goal of $2,020, has been reached, and we are very close to getting to the pastor's challenge goal. So Jason can feel the buzz cut coming. All right, so I think he's excited. And uh, I've been trying to take vocal lessons for when I, when I sing Victory in Jesus. So with that, let's open up together with prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together in your house. Father, thank you for giving us the honor of worshiping you, to praise you, to honor you. It's such a privilege, such an honor to do that, Father. Today, I pray that you would focus our hearts on you, that you would speak to us individually, and that through the preaching of your word and singing and worship, that we would become just a little bit more like Jesus. Bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you a second. Good morning and welcome. Good to see you all. Let's stand together and we're going to start off by singing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. started long ago. God created us. He loved us and wanted to be close to us. Everything was how it was supposed to be. But we fell. We sinned. And no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't make it right. But that didn't stop him. He reached down to us. He sent his son. As the perfect sacrifice to save us. One sacred effort to redeem mankind. We are part of this effort. Going across the world. To every tribe. Every nation. No matter the cost. When we signed on the dotted line and said we want to follow Jesus, that means we left everything behind. And that he is now 
my hopes and my dreams. We share the gospel, plant churches, and make disciples. Because we believe the gospel can transform lives and communities. We go to the people who have yet to hear. Sharing the story with them so that they can tell others. Multiplying the story of God's grace among all people. One sacred effort. It's just wonderful how we as a body of Christ can come united in one effort to carry the Great Commission throughout the world. When Jesus tells his disciples to be his witnesses, he's not giving a mandate just for that period and that time. He's giving a mandate to the church for all time. As the body of Christ, we're like an orchestra, we're like a band. Each member is so vital, is so important for making beautiful music. For over a century, churches like yours, working together, have sent people around the world through IMB to share God's love with those who have never heard. And if we sent them out alone, then they would not make it because they wouldn't be able to stand. But if we send them out as the church, then they can stand against the world. 100% of your gifts go to helping send out your missionaries to tell the story. Too many times we get so interested in building our own kingdoms, but we've got to look at the bigger picture. Again, this is one sacred effort. All of us coming together to impact the world. And we've got to get behind our workers and support them. Let's make world missions a priority through our giving to the Light of Moon and the Christmas offerings so we can support these efforts that are being made all across the world. So we come together as one body, as one sacred calling to God to touch this world. Jesus will smile on us and we'll change this world for him. We are all part of one sacred effort to see people across the world proclaiming together at the top of their lungs that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that video does a, a really good job of reminding us that we're all in this together. It's one sacred effort that each person uh, has a role in reaching the nations with the gospel. Uh, these are not our missionaries in the sense that we are divorced from that mandate. It's the mandate that the Lord has given all of us. And so as you give uh, to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, 100% of those gifts, every penny goes out uh, to support our missionaries who are serving overseas for the International Mission Board. Um, also, uh, just as a side note, um, we're not passing the plates right now because of COVID, and so we do have a giving box right over there. It's got the big bow on top of it, um, or you can give in the box in the worship center. Uh, for your regular giving, um, you just do your normal thing. If it's a Lottie Moon gift, be sure and mark it as Lottie Moon so that we can get that counted appropriately. Everybody doing good this morning? Everybody awake? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for the privilege of being part of this great commission that you have given us to make disciples of all nations. And uh, Lord, I pray for those who are serving right now who have gone out from local churches here in the United States to go to the far ends of the earth. Lord, I pray for them. I pray that you'd meet their needs. I pray that you'd accomplish much. I pray for the people who have never heard I pray for those places where your name is not known, where there are not churches. I pray for the people who do not have a Bible in uh, their language. Lord, we pray that your gospel would go out, that your word would be translated, and that they would be able to hear the good news of Jesus. I pray you'd bless both the gift and the giver today and be glorified through our giving, through our singing, through the preaching of your word, and through our response to it. In all these things, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue uh, in the attitude of worship as we sing the chorus of O Come All Ye Faithful.
stand with me one more time. So, I love this chorus. One word, Emmanuel. <laughs> This is the story of a ragtag bunch of church members who set out to perform a Christmas play, and the director who tried his hardest to just keep it all together. The glory of Christmas. There's a little bit of controversy over my choice to cast Tony as the wise man in our church nativity play, because, well, Tony can sometimes be... Yep, that's... That's some good birch. Birch? Why would they use birch? It's not even indigenous to Israel. Did Tony's just a little bit of a know-it-all. Hmm. Did Acacia not even cross your mind? That's probably birch. Potato salad is of German origin, brought over here by European settlers. You know, fascinating point. The carb load on that is 37 grams. Great for uh, marathon runners. There's no doubt that Tony knows a lot of useless facts. But when he doesn't know something? Now, of all the wise man's gifts, myrrh was the most profound. He's used to prepare a body for burial. What does real myrrh smell like? Uh, I imagine it has like a lush floral scent. Nah, it's woodsy. Warm, aromatic, musky. Oh, uh, my mom leads the essential oils small group. Hmm. But... There's a certain something about Tony. Something that he doesn't even see about himself. Put your shoulder into it so it doesn't strip the head. That's like... Hey. Well done. That's good. <laughs> good job. Tony has the kind of heart that understands where the real treasures are. What they are. Who they are. And he understands the King of Kings came first as the lowly servant. This baby, this beautiful gift, this is the glory of God, 
glory of Christmas, who would eventually sacrifice himself for us. For me, well, let's just say, with that kind of knowledge, you can never approach the manger quite the same way again. That's why he's the wise man. The story is told of a small southern town where a na nativity scene showed great skill and talent in its construction. One small feature, though, bothered a man who was driving through on a trip. You see, the three wise men were all wearing firemen's helmets. Totally unable to come up with a reason or explanation, he left the scene and stopped at a quick stop on the edge of town. And the visitor asked the man behind the counter about the helmets. The man behind the counter exploded into a rage, yelling at the man. You Yankees never read your Bible. <laughs> the man assured him that he certainly did read his Bible, <laughs> but just couldn't recall anything about firemen in the Bible. So the man whipped out his Bible from behind the counter, ruffled through some pages, and finally jabbed his finger at a passage. Sticking it in the man's face, he said, See, it says right here, the wise man came from afar. <laughs> <Ba -dum -ching. laughs> oh man, today, you guys, today is the Sunday before Christmas. And for the last few weeks, we have done several character studies from the Christmas story. Uh, we have studied Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. And today is our last full character study before Christmas and our Christmas Eve service. And we're going to take a look at the wise men. So these men surprise us at every turn. And by looking at their example, we are going to prepare our hearts and minds as we draw close to Christmas and the true reason for the season. If you wouldn't mind opening up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12. All right. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secret, secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. 
I want you to join me there, and uh, let's just make some observations this morning from uh, the text that Pastor Justin read. The first thing that we see from the text is this, the wise men saw. The wise men saw. Now, we've already seen that God made a birth announcement. We talked about that last week. He made the birth announcement of His Son to the simple, lowly shepherds. He, didn't, he did not make that birth announcement in a temple or in a synagogue, or to the high priest, or anyone like that. He made it out in a field where the stinky shepherds were keeping watch over their flock by night. But in Matthew 2, we find that God not only led the shepherds to Jesus, but He also led the wise men to come and to see as well. Because that's what God does. He's a missionary God. He is the one who sent His Son to die for us, to make a way. And so the Bible says in verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men came from the east and arrived in Jerusalem. Now, the very first phrase in in verse number 1 says, after Jesus was born. That tells us when this occurred. And uh, in fact, we really go forward quite a bit here. Um, At this point, it's likely that a good bit of time has passed. I know we have the wise men right there beside the shepherds in our nativity scenes, but uh, there's a good chance that uh, about two years has already passed by this point in time, uh, pretty close to it. And we still see, though, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, uh, if you weren't with us last week, let me review just a a little bit uh, the city of Bethlehem was also known as the city of David. This is where David was born. It's where David was the young shepherd boy. It's where David was anointed by Saul as the new king. And so it's in Bethlehem, uh, the son of David, the Messiah, the king of kings, the chief shepherd, Jesus, was born. And this took place in the days of King Herod. And, And Pastor Justin, in just a moment, will tell us more about Herod. He was an absolute madman. Uh, But for now, notice this next phrase in verse 1. Wise men arrived from the east in Jerusalem. Now, let me start out by pointing out that we have a cardinal direction here. We have east. It tells us they came from the east. It occurred to me that this passage of Scripture is written perfectly for Utahns. Or should I say Salt Lakeans? Is that that even a a word? I don't know. But I remember not long after I arrived here and learned about the grid system, and somebody said, hey, let's meet in the southwest corner of the northeast parking lot. Or my GPS will tell me, you know, go north on 1300 east, go east on 9000 south, and I'm like, ah, this is craziness. It takes a minute to comprehend all that. And so it says that the wise men came from the east, So if they're coming from the east and they're going towards Jerusalem, they're traveling in which direction? West. Good. And so the wise men from the east saw his star rising and it would have been in the westward part of the sky. So who are these so-called wise men? We know who they're not. They're not graduates of BYU, right? That's not who they are. They're not graduates of Clemson or Florida either, just for the record. But I did, know, I did see that commentators have theorized that the descendants of the wise men founded the University of Georgia. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing? The Greek word magoi or magoi is translated as wise men here in the CSB. The NIV uses the word magi, just leaves it at that. This is referring to... Uh, a class of Persian wise men who were interpreters of special signs, particularly in astrology, studying the the heavens. Uh, It later widened to be uh, also interpreters of special signs like magicians and deceivers. But here it's, it's looking to those men that are wise, that are studying the sky, and they understand the stars. And if you peek ahead to verse number two, it says, they saw the star at its rising. And then if you fast forward to verse 7, Herod is asking these wise men for the exact time that the star appeared. And on and on it goes. These wise men from the east were noticing and following an unusual star. And they knew it was unusual because of their familiarity with stars. 
So coming from the east would mean that they were coming from the direction of Babylon or ancient Persia. Okay? Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Think about this for a second. If they were coming from the area of Babylon and ancient Persia, can you think of an influential person from the Bible who would have been there? Perhaps Daniel. You know, think about Daniel. You think about all those Jewish people who were in captivity, and uh, Daniel was there and was influential, and many of the Jewish people were left behind even as they returned to Jerusalem. And so Daniel himself prophesied in Daniel 9 about the anointed one and how he would be cut off. And so it, it's noteworthy that just given where these wise men are coming from, they very well may have had a decent understanding of the Hebrew scriptures that went alongside of their knowledge of the heavens, of the stars. So where do they go? They go to Jerusalem. That makes a lot of sense. It's the holy city. It's where the temple is. It's, it's the place of sacrifice. They were following the star. But was it the star that they were really looking for? No. Look at verse 2. They asked this question, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They were following a star, but they were really seeking the king. And you know, that's what the theme of Matthew is. It's the king has come, the Messiah is here. And so with their knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures, maybe they even knew Numbers 24, 17, which says, I see him, but not now. I, per I perceive him, but not near. A star will come from Jacob. A scepter will rise from Israel. Maybe God spoke to them directly, just like he did Joseph and Mary and Zechariah. We, we don't know that. We know that God does warn them later on in verse 12 to return by another route. Do not go back to Herod. Um, and we know what Herod did after that. But as a side note, these wise men who had come searching this king, the question that's often asked is how many of them were there? How many wise men were there? And what does tradition say? Three, right? And tradition says three because there were three gifts given, right? We know that there, were more, there was more than one wise man. It says wise men. It's in the plural. But it, there could have been two. There could have been three. There could have been a whole bunch of them. We really don't know. We just know that there were three gifts given. They, it says, for we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. At the beginning, we made this observation. The wise men saw. The first thing the wise men saw was a star. Now, some have tried to explain what this star was. We have a big happening tomorrow night. Did you know that? We're going to be watching the sky as Jupiter and Saturn come together. They're calling it the Christmas star because it's going to appear so brightly in the sky. In what part of the sky? I think it's southwest, right? Yeah, see, I'm getting those directions. And so, you know, was it something like that? What Was it a comet? Was was it Cupid? I mean, that's the reindeer, I'm sorry. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes, by the way. <laughs> oh, I threw my own self off from time to time. But what was it? I, I don't know, because it could have been that God used something natural. But when we see the behavior of this star, we know that it's supernatural. And so God, who is the creator God, has the right to do whatever he wants to do, right? So whatever the case, God used this star to lead them to Jesus. In Matthew 2, 9, it says, And there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. You hear how it's moving, and it's stopping, and it's pointing them so that they would see God is at work. And the wise men have come to worship him. And verse 10 says, when they saw him, they were overwhelmed with joy. Floods of joy or their soul. It wasn't enough just to see the star. They had come to see the king and see him they did. Verse 11 says, entering the house, they saw the child. So they saw the star and now they're seeing the child with his mother Mary. And, you know, it was an amazing star. It was an amazing thing. But when they left and went back home, I don't think that they focused on the star. I think they focused on the king that they came to know and to see there in Bethlehem.
You know, when you read of the feeding of the 5,000, you know, the point of the story is not how good the food was. The point of the story is who Jesus is. And that's what we see here as well. The wise men saw a star, but more importantly, they saw him. And God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, leads us to come and to see him and to know him. Coming to see Jesus as he is and coming to trust him for salvation like the wise men leaves us overwhelmed with joy. Do you remember, if you're here this morning and you know Jesus, do you remember when you came to know him, and what he did in your life? What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. You know it? Since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy or my soul, you know the next line, like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Friends, today, wise men and women still bow to Jesus. They still bow before the king. Pastor. The wise men came their purpose was to worship the king. And just reviewing what Pastor Jason said, uh, the wise men were aware of the meaning of the star, but were unsure exactly where to go. Um, to find the king of the Jews, it was logical to look in Jerusalem. Um, it also seems, as Jason pointed out, that the star stood still after rising, and looking at verses 9 and 10, it began to move to lead the wise men to Bethlehem once they were done with Herod. Before then, the star was simply over Israel from the wise men's perspective coming from the east. So I just think this is interesting. On one side, okay, we have the wise men who knew about the birth of the king of the Jews, okay? And from verse 2, we see that they knew he was worthy to be worshipped, yet they didn't know exactly where he was to be born. And to me, that indicates that while they have access to Hebrew scripture, they probably didn't have access to the prophecies of Micah, all right? Because that's quoted there in verse 6. They had some access to scripture, but not total access. So they knew that he was born, they knew he was worthy to be worshipped, but they didn't know where he was. So there, there's the wise men on one side. Then you have on the other side, highly ironic, we have the Jews, all right, this is King Herod, the chief priests, and the scribes that are mentioned in this passage. They have access to all of the Hebrew scriptures, right? So they knew where the Messiah was supposed to be born, but they totally missed or maybe ignored that this child was worthy to be worshipped. Isn't that ironic? So when these chief priests and scribes answer, Herod and the wise men, uh, they quote Micah 5.2, but it's interesting, and I think we do this too, we're guilty of it, uh, when we quote Micah 5.2, we don't quote the entire verse, uh, and that neither do they in this passage in verse 6. So I want to look at Micah 5.2, we're going to actual, actually to Micah, and uh, it's right up here on the screen, and this is what Micah 5.2 says, the entire verse, Bethlehem Ephrathah. You are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. That's where their quote ends. This is the end of the verse. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. You see, Jesus' origin wasn't that stable. Jesus' origin wasn't Bethlehem or the place where he grew up in Galilee no, Jesus' origin is from antiquity. It's from prehistoric times. That's another definition of the word. You know, his origin is from before time. His origin is from eternity. And just to point that out, I want to quote Deuteronomy 33, 27, which uses the same word that's translated antiquity in Micah, but this is what Deuteronomy says. The eternal God is your dwelling place. Notice it doesn't say the antiquity God. The word carries the, con the concept of eternity right. from before time. 
So the eternal God is your dwelling place. Habakkuk has another example in chapter 1, verse 12, and it uses the same word, and it says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Again, it doesn't say, are you not from antiquity? No, the concept is there. And you see, Jesus, the Messiah, is from eternity. You know, this simple truth was missed by the religious rulers of Jesus' day. Jesus was almost stoned to death many times for making claims uh, that had to do with this. When he claimed to be before Abraham in John 8, they tried to kill him. Um, They did the same thing in John 10 when he said, I and the Father are one. Ultimately, it was one of the charges that he was crucified for as he was equating himself with God the Father. Yet here we see in Micah 5, 2, it describes who Christ is. He is, in fact, God. While it's easier to see this in hindsight, right? I don't want to totally put the religious rulers down. I really do think they're without excuse, all right? These guys knew scriptures very well, better than I probably ever will. Uh, Yet they were disturbed right along with the king, as we see in verse 3 of Matthew 2. I just think it's ironic that Gentile, gen, yeah, Gentile astrologers, magicians, pagans, if you will, knew to worship the Christ child, but Jesus' own people rejected him, which we see John 1 tell us, he came to his own, but his own rejected him. But the wise men knew that the king that they sought was worthy of worship. At the end of our passage, today, we see that the wise men are told to avoid Herod. And just after that, we see that Joseph is told to take Jesus to Egypt. So in Herod, we see just how ugly human pride can get. See, Herod was a half-Jewish convert that only played the part uh, in order to stay in charge of the Jews. Uh, He was known to kill anyone around him, who he suspected of challenging him. This included his wives and children. Caesar Augustus even said this about him. He said that he would rather be Herod's pig than his son, which is a play on words in the Greek. Herod's reign was challenged when the wise men showed up. And we see in verse 3 that Herod, and it says all of Jerusalem, And I think that that probably likely references the religious leaders that are mentioned in verse 4, not necessarily everyone in Jerusalem. But we see that Herod and all of Jerusalem uh, were deeply disturbed. And this word here, uh, it really carries the idea of terror. He was terrified. It's the same word that's going to be used later in Matthew to describe the disciples' feeling when they see Jesus walking on water and think that he's a ghost. It's the same word. They were terrified. So this is Herod and the religious leaders. They are terrified. And Herod's response is to eliminate the threat. So Herod attempts to manipulate the wise men and claims he wants to worship Messiah too, asking them to report where they find the Messiah. However, as we know, Herod was already plotting to kill Jesus. Now, while we were preparing this message together, Jason framed the person of Herod well. This is what Jason said. He said, kings don't easily bow down to other kings. Kings don't easily bow down to to other kings. Herod isn't wanting to worship the king. He's wanting to kill the king in order to remain king. Herod refuses to accept that Jesus is the true king. And he certainly didn't understand that Jesus isn't just the rightful king of the Jews. Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. And that all will bow before him. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 5 and read through verse 11 together. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Okay. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, 
who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I think that just deserves an amen. Amen. Yeah. You see, Herod refused to bow, but we know We know that one day Herod will bow before Jesus. All will bow before him, and all will confess that he is Lord. So, whose example will you follow today? Will you be like Herod and resist and fight against the one true king of kings? Will you be like Herod ruling over your own domain, acting like a king, acting like a fake king that won't easily bow before the true king? Or will you be like the wise men who seek Jesus and willingly, joyfully bow before him? You know, the reality is, one day you will bow. You'll either do it willingly or you will be forced to. And I'm telling you, now is the day to choose to bow willingly. And let me tell you something. Jesus is worthy to be worshipped. He is no tyrant king like Herod. He is no fake puppet king. He is the most gracious, merciful, and loving king. He is also the most just, righteous, and powerful king. And just in case you think it sounds a bit harsh to to force people to bow, know this, no person in all of history in that moment will doubt who the one true king of kings is. I want to encourage you today, be like the wise men. If you're hearing this message, Perhaps the Lord is showing you your own sort of star, and he's leading you to Jesus. Do you see that? Like the wise men saw? Seek him, approach him today, and bow before him. He is the only good and perfect king, worthy of all worship and praise and honor and glory to the Father. If Jesus is already your king, consider this. How do you worship him? Jason mentioned, do you remember when you first came to the king, the joy? Have you experienced that joy recently? Have you ever physically fallen to your knees in worship? That sounds a bit awkward, maybe embarrassing. Just consider the wise men. These are prestigious, learned men. Perhaps they were clothed in rich fabric based on the gifts that they bear. When they see the child, what do they do? No regard for clothing, no regard for embarrassing or being awkward. With overwhelming joy, they fall to their knees before a child. What's your response today? Jesus was just a toddler, and they fell to their knees. His very presence was enough. Now think, to us, Jesus is our crucified, resurrected, and ascended Lord and King. Will you bow before him? He is worthy of all your worship. I just want to go on record and say that learned men use words like prestigious. Okay. I need to go ahead and bow. <laughs> <laughs> we, the wise men saw, the wise men worshipped, and flowing out of their worship, the wise men gave. You know, I try to say that. I try to, 
even as we give, it's worship. As we give ourselves, our lives, it's, it's worship. And they fell to their knees and, and they worshiped him because he was worthy. Um, if, if they did know the, some of the Hebrew scriptures and knew of Daniel's prophecy, then they would have known the Messiah will one day be cut off. And it seems that the wise men have some intuition um, for what is taking place and what a big deal this is. And so in verse 11, it says that they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh were fitting of royalty, gifts for the king. And they're given here, as, again, as an act of worship. Certainly, these gifts would have been useful uh, pretty soon when Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus will have to flee to Egypt you know, to, to get away from Herod. The, these gifts will come in handy, but there's also some deeper meaning here to the gifts that are being given. By bringing gold, the wise men were acknowledging the kingship of Jesus. It was common to bring gold for royal visits. One example of that is Queen Sheba. When she was visiting King Solomon, she brought large amounts of gold, it says in 1 Kings 10. And then by bringing frankincense, not only were they acknowledging him as king, but they were also acknowledging him as God, as deity, and as the, the high priest. They were focusing on that priestly role of Jesus Christ. It, it was uh, frankincense, when it was burned, created a strong and beautiful aroma. And they, they talked about it a little bit, I think, was it, or was, was it myrrh? It was myrrh. But... You know, you know if, uh, if you think about how essential oils people like to use their little diffusers, how many are in the house? How many don't want to raise their hand? <laughs> but you know how we will use those essential oils for all kinds of reasons, all kinds of medicinal purposes as well. Same thing here with frankincense, but you couldn't find it at Walmart. Um, you couldn't even order it on Amazon because it was very, very expensive. And so... Um, it was something that was precious, and so it was associated with worship, with temple worship, with burning incense on the altar. And so in the book of Exodus, chapter 30, verse 34, frankincense is a part of uh, incense that's being burnt for sacrifices. So in this way, frankincense is pointing to that priestly, that high priestly role of Jesus, which we see in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Then, by bringing myrrh, we see that they brought gifts for a king, they brought gifts for deity, for the high priestly role, but they also brought something that was used for anointing oil, which was used for preparation for burial. And so, we see again that these wise men had some intuition, didn't they, of who Jesus was and, and what he had come to do that he is a, a unique king, a king like no other. And so they came bearing gifts. All right, listen up. If you've fallen asleep, wise men still come bearing gifts. I say that every year at this time because it's the Sunday before Christmas, and some of you men need to be reminded that Christmas is coming. And if you haven't been down to Walmart yet or wherever you need to go, wise men still come bearing gifts. You got it? All right, that's important. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, perfect will of God. Now, I want to back up and pick up this in verse 12. Uh, the wise men worshipped through the giving of gifts, but they also worship by obeying God's command. It says, being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. The wise men knew that it was better to obey God. It was better to obey Him. You know, sometimes God will ask us to do A, and we'll say, God, I'll do B, C, and D, but He called you and asked you to do A. Obedience is better. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 is laying that out for us, that we are to give of ourselves, that we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, seeking to be obedient 
to him. How about it? The wise men saw. The wise men worshipped. The wise men gave. The same invitation extended to the shepherds was extended to the wise men and is extended to all today. Come and see. Come and see this king and give yourself to him. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is God's perfect will for us. Our wise man in the video made this statement. This baby, this beautiful gift, the glory of Christmas, with that, with that kind of knowledge, you can never approach the manger the same way again. I want to move towards closing and tell you just a quick story. July 6, 2011, a hiker was attacked by a female grizzly bear in Yellowstone National Park. He and his wife were visiting the park with hundreds of thousands of guests, just like they do each summer. And apparently, they surprised this mother grizzly and her cubs. The National Park Service issued a statement saying, in an attempt to defend a perceived threat to her cubs, the bear attacked and fatally wounded the man. Now, that man did not intend any harm for that mama bear's cubs, but she didn't know that. And she responded according to her nature with fatal results. You know what? The Proverbs say something about this. Proverbs 17, 12 says, let a, robber, let, let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. And as dangerous it is, as it is to cross paths with a mama bear, it says it's even more dangerous to cross paths with a fool. With the knowledge that we have, we can't look at the manger the same way. This world is full of fools. This world is full of people who are following hard after the things of this world. They're following hard after fulfilling their desires of the flesh. But, oh, dear friend, there's nothing more important to know than this. Jesus is king. And as Pastor Justin said, we will either bow to him <laughs> willingly now as Lord or we'll bow before him one day anyway. He is king. And those who know it, and those who know him and follow him are wise. We just want to encourage you this morning to see the Lord Jesus today. Bow before him. Offer him all that you have and obey him. And just as Pastor Jason asked, do you know him? He is the king. Will you bow before him? He is worthy of your worship. Will you give yourself to him in obedience? He is a good master. We're about to have a time of invitation. And during this time of invitation, we want to encourage you to come forward to receive Jesus if you have not done that. Come forward, talk with either Jason or I, and we will walk you through how to receive the one true king and Lord of lords. Or where you are, you can bow your heart before him and worship him just as the wise men did. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the word that we've heard this morning. Lord, thank you that you're out and it does not return void. And so, Lord, I pray today that it would accomplish its work. Lord, may we respond in worship. We've, we've prayed, we've, we've been singing, we've heard the preaching, but now may we respond in obedience as worship to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand this morning and our closing hymn.
love that song. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Hey, thank you so much for being here this morning for our 832 worship service. And also, hello to those who are watching on live stream. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget our Christmas Eve services are on Christmas Eve at 4.30 and 6.30. And uh, Pastor Justin can get tickets for you if you have requested them already, or if you haven't, you can request them this morning. And um, the tickets don't cost anything, but it's helping us prepare for our crowd sizes for setup. So be sure and see him for a ticket. Anything else? Any announcement about the books that are out there? There are some books on your way out on the left in the hallway. Those are free for the taking if anybody would like one. Uh, Dave Simon's going to come and close us in prayer. He's our deacon on call for this week. And so after he prays, we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Pastor. Lord, uh, just thank you for this church and our pastors. Uh, Lord, we just know that you're the the focus of the season uh, among anything else. Lord, just uh, be with us as we go through the week. And uh, just help us to focus on you. And uh, we just love you and praise you in your holy, precious name. Amen.